So this YouTube video is on the trigeminal and facial cranial nerves. And this is to support two longer videos on the same subject. But this is for those that are perhaps new to veterinary neuro neurology who need an introduction or for those that want a revision aid that's quicker. So our aim is to look at the function of those nerves, how we test them, what normal looks like and what abnormal looks like. And these are the two longer videos that do a deeper dive into the same subject. So the trigeminal nerve is the fifth cranial nerve and there are four important functions. The first is that it is motor through the mandibular branch to the muscles of mastication. So if you think about what muscles you use when you are chewing food, um, then it is those muscles um, and uh, so we have the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle, the pterygoids medial to the jaw, um, and it is also supplying some other uh, muscles, which I've listed uh, in smaller words here, because if you're doing this as a revision aid, that's not so important for you to know. The, it is also sensory to the skin of the head, the meninges, the eye, the nasal cavity, and the oral cavity, pretty much the entire head. It does proprioception of your head, the jaw, teeth, the extraocular muscles, so you don't, um, uh, so you chew without uh, chewing your tongue, um, without um, damaging your teeth, etc. It's also unusually a autonomic conduit, so it doesn't have any actual autonomic uh, nerves itself, but many of these autonomic nerves hitch a ride on the sympathetic supply, so, uh, sorry, on the trigeminal um, nerves. So, for example, the sympathetic supply to the eye is with the maxillary, then the ophthalmic branch, and the parasympathetic supply to the lacrimal glands and salivary glands also travel with the trigeminal branches. By comparison, the facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve, and it is motor to the muscles which in humans are called the, the uh, muscles of facial expression. And I still use that in veterinary things because I think it helps people to remember which muscles, if you think about uh, which muscles you use to smile, frown, etc., then it is those more superficial muscles. Uh, in the dog, cat uh, and other species, then these muscles are important for moving the ear, um, for moving the lips. And depending on the species, um, uh, facial nerve paralysis can be very disabling. So, for example, a horse will use its facial muscles to, to prehend food. Uh, and therefore, uh, a facial nerve paralysis in a, in a horse means they're not able to pick up grass. And think about what a facial nerve paralysis will do to an elephant uh, not able to move their trunk and prehend food. So uh, the effect of a facial nerve problem will vary with the, 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 the species. It also does these other muscles, which again, I've put in small because they're less important for a veterinary student, for example, to know as a revision aid. It is sensory to the external uh, ear of the canal, uh, and it does taste for the rostral two thirds of the tongue. There is some parasympathetic uh, supply from the facial nerve They go into the lacrimal glands and the mandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So when we look at head uh, sensation, uh, the back part of the head and the top part of the neck, the, cr uh, the, the cranial part of the neck and the ear is the C2 nerve root. Uh, very important um, for um, diseases that affect that area, for example, uh, Chiari malformation and stringomyelia. Whereas the trigeminal nerve does the, the, the whole of the head uh, and in the oral cavity uh, and in the nasal cavity, uh, and the facial nerve does that very inner area of the ear, um, which uh, not the very outer regions of the ear. So what does it look like when you have a lesion of one of these nerves? So this is the first appearance of a trigeminal nerve lesion. And because it is motor to those big muscles of the head, then a more chronic lesion will result in uh, atrophy of those muscles so that you see that zygomatic arch much more prominently. As you can see in this smooth collie, um, you have the asymmetry to the, to the head. So when you're assessing the masticatory muscle bulk, then you should feel 
those muscles for that for that bulk and that's very important in a in a dog or a cat with longer hair or any species with longer hair because it may not be evident when you just look at the silhouette of the head that the animal has a problem so it's important to feel those muscles if they have a bilateral problem then they will lose the strength in their jaw and they may not be able to close their mouth as you can see in these animals here. Uh, if this is unilateral then they usually can close their mouth because the other side compensates and, and, and helps keep that jaw closed. You may be able to detect a slight decrease in jaw tone. In comparison a facial nerve paralysis will result in a droop on one side of their head or both sides if it's bilateral. Um, this dog has a unilateral problem uh, on the right side so we can see that their ear is, is flopped down in, in this dog and that we have this floppy lip here. Um, uh, the floppy lip you can see that the outside folds of the lip become very loose and as a result you tend to drool and cannot keep in food in on that side. So one of the uh, important functions of the facial nerve is to work the buccal muscles that help push the food from the cheek region into the center of the mouth so that you can swallow and when those don't work then you ha have a tendency to drool and drop food out the side of their mouth um, or make an awful lot of mess when you're trying to drink so the owner may report a lot of saliva uh, in the water bowl. Uh, they're also unable to close their eye and you may notice that the eye may have in the acute phase anyway a, 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 a wider palpebral fissure. In the chronic phase the muscle becomes contracted and you, you get a smaller fissure. So how do we assess these nerves? And actually they are assessed in tangent because we use reflexes that has the uh, trigeminal nerve as the sensory arm and the facial nerve, uh, uh, nerve as the motor arm. So you are assessing both nerves together. So those are the palpebral reflex where we touch the medial canthus and then the lateral canthus uh, of the eye and see the eye closed. Uh, the reason why you test both canthuses is because the um, ophthalmic branch does the medial canthus and the uh, maxillary branch does the lateral canthus. And so if you have disease of one branch of the trigeminal nerve, then uh, you may see a lack of response on, on, on one side of the eye. Then we have the corneal reflex. This is where you touch the eye. Um, sometimes you use your finger, but it's better to use a, a, a cotton bud um, to see that the eye is retracted and the eyelids close. And we have sensation of the head uh, and for that we we'll see two um, results. We'll have a behavioural response from the prosencephalon cortex uh, because we want to see that the animal is able to perceive that uh, uh, irritation to their face. And then we have the reflex muscle movement which is the facial nerve. And then we also have the menace response, um, which uh, involves quite, uh, the, the optic nerve plus um, all the cortical processing and the cerebellum before it gets down to the facial nerve, but it's also used. Now, when you have a facial nerve paralysis for the palpebral corneal reflex and the menace response, the eyeball will still be retracted by the uh, Ducens nerve working the retrobulbal muscle and the third eyelid will flick up to protect that eye. So the absence of a palpebral corneal reflex in a, an animal with a facial nerve paralysis does look quite different to one with a trigeminal nerve paralysis. We're going to compare those here. So I have to thank my colleague Fabio uh, Stabili for this, this case here. So as you can see, here's testing sensation for that dog. It was a little bit of a menace response really with that uh, closure but we can see this dog in comparison has a palpebral on the left side but not on the right side. We compare the corneal reflex there and the corneal reflex there. In comparison when we look at a facial nerve paralysis, we can see when we do the palpebral there that we get that third eyelid flick up, just there. 
and a menace response. Again, that third eyelid flick. It's a different dog here. We have no palpebral, but does she have sensation? Yes, when we do the corneal reflex, we can see that we get that third eyelid flick. And obviously it's important to test the sensation in the rest of this dog's um, uh, face to make sure that uh, there isn't a trigeminal deficit as well as a facial nerve deficit. In this dog, we can see that there is a motor deficit of the trigeminal nerve with that extensive muscle atrophy. But this dog does have intact facial sensation. And we're going to see the comparison here. So just tickling the planum of the nostrils. And we can see that behavioral response and muscle movement from this dog. Muscle movement being the facial nerve, of course. We use the nostrils to compare one side to another, um, uh, which is the easiest way to compare. And then we have uh, the facial sensation there from the ear. We also need to assess jaw tone. And that was a gag there as well. So when we assess jaw tone, we are opening the jaw and assessing the resistance, which is normal in this cat. And markedly reduced in this dog with a bilateral problem. So in summary, the trigeminal nerve is primarily responsible for facial sensation and motor control of the muscles of mastication, which you use for chewing. The facial nerve controls facial expression muscles, um, uh, it conveys taste sensation for the rostral two thirds of the tongue and provides parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal and salivary glands. And together, these nerves coordinate at critical sensory and motor functions essential for feeding, facial movement and social signaling. Uh, if you want to go on and look at some other videos, then I would suggest the longer or short version of Horner's syndrome, which uh, because Horner syndrome often accompanies trigeminal nerve lesions. Thank you very much.